time to reevaluate and to reset in some ways. Hello, I'm Gillian Knight, and welcome to Art Fictions, bringing you stories of art and the art of stories as myself and a guest artist discuss a piece of fiction and the artist's practice, exploring the ideas which govern both of these creative endeavours. Today, I'm thrilled to be speaking with the very talented Hannah Brown. Hannah comes with the confident title, Weighted in History, of British landscape painter, though depictions of oldie worldy grandeur these are definitely not. Instead, her paintings connect with the experience of long looking and ordinary views, often returning to sites which hold personal meaning for her. While they depict the outside, they also conjure up glimpses of remembered experience. Their details are exquisite. They acknowledge the beauty of the countryside and the snippets of it found in urban parklands, all the while sitting at the edge of Erie. These are slowly made paintings with a stunning level of learned craftsmanship. This is the second last episode of the current series and I hope you enjoy our conversation. As always, very many thanks for listening. I think they're horrible and awful, but at the same time, I love them. Hannah Brown, welcome to Art Fictions. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've been looking forward to it. You've chosen As I Walked Out One Evening, which is a poem by Winston Hugh Auden, better known as W.H. Auden in 1937. So very quickly, the poem is about the pondering of a man walking down Bristol Street, probably in Birmingham, where Auden grew up. And he is describing a conversation between the assertion of eternal love and its undermining by eternal time. It's delivered in the language of an English folk song, and the poem uses very simple language to deliver its deeply philosophical point. I was so thrilled not only to read a poem, but to read a poem that didn't even take up two pages when I printed it out. Yeah, it's a page and a quarter, isn't it? Yeah, and that's the thing, is that he writes very simply, but I found the poem quite devastating in its effect. I wonder if you might read a small section of the poem just to give an idea of the tone of it. So this is halfway through. In headaches and in worry, vaguely life leaks away and time will have his fancy tomorrow or today. And then it goes on. Oh, plunge your hands in water, plunge them in up to the wrist. Stare, stare in the basin and wonder what you've missed. That was very lovely. You're a semi-professional. Semi-professional, I'll take that. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me, Hannah, why did you choose this poem? This is kind of perfect for me, art fictions, because I love reading fiction. And I think about fiction a lot in relation to my work because so much of it is a fiction. It's based on a form of reality, but I'm really taking liberties with the source, imagery or place. And yet I didn't know what piece of writing to choose. And I guess, like you said at the beginning, there's something very succinct about a poem of being short and condensed and that it can involve so much about one's life, our lives, living, mortality, the environment, love, time, really big things that I think quite a lot of people have thought about since an early age, but in such a small space. And so I could have chosen so many books that have similar themes, but there was such pleasure in it being on a page and a quarter. And when I read, I really immerse myself. I read every evening now that I'm trying to wean myself off television. I was addicted and I read every single word out loud in my head to myself, like you would read a book to a sort of child. I can't skim read and I can't read fast. I'm just rubbish at it. But I also don't want to. When I invested in a book, I want it to last as long as possible. And I really enjoy the escapism of it, going into this other world. And it's so visual for me. Some people don't have that. I didn't realize till a few years ago, listening to a radio program, that some people don't have the pictures in their heads, and I can't imagine that. Anyway, I'm slightly waffling, but part of the reason of choosing the poem was it touches on all these things I'm interested in, but I just didn't want to reread a book um, to talk about it. Once I've read it, I don't revisit books. 
And I considered a Robert Goddard crime fiction because I really enjoy his writing and he's a British writer and they're often set in the West Country. And then I remembered this poem, which I'd first heard maybe five or six years ago listening to the radio and I loved it straight away. I don't know much about poetry. I don't read very much poetry and I don't understand all of it. I've got notes and there's question marks all over it. But it's like it's unraveling or maybe, you know, because it's about time as the years go past, I understand it more clearly. So I just I think it just gives so much. It's such a beautiful piece of writing. Yeah, it is indeed. And just coming back to the idea of it revealing itself, it is descriptive of the very simple scenery that the poem begins with. As I walked out one evening, walking down Bristol Street, the crowds upon the pavement were fields of harvest wheat. So he sets us up straight away with this idea of a landscape, but we're in a city environment. So it's a sort of cityscape. And then bit by bit, these really huge ideas about love and about time eternal reveal themselves. And I felt like he was making the point that love is not really eternal the way time is. I would argue that love goes in sort of cycles and those cycles are a continuum. But anyway, so we see at the end of the poem, the lovers are gone. The clocks had ceased their chiming and the river ran on. So if it was longer, we wouldn't get that suddenness of ending. I couldn't agree more. And I wrote in my notes at the end, next to And the Deep River Ran On, that nature continues. And something that I always find, I mean, we hope it continues, reassuring about nature, it carries on, no matter what's happening to us or what we do day to day or and how those days add up to a, a life and whether that life is well lived or how it's lived, that nature just carries on doing its thing. And it doesn't really care if you're in a bad mood or a good mood or what's happened. And I find um, a real solace in nature. And right from the beginning of the poem, I was on board as soon as I heard the first few lines. Just the idea of going out for an evening walk. I love evening walks. I love that point of the day when I'm still pretending that it's daylight. It's growing dark around you, but your eyes get accustomed to it. But the way he describes the crowds on the pavements being fields of wheat. And I've lived in London for a long time now, over 20 years, but I grew up in the countryside. And I think I always have it with me in some way. And I'm spending a lot of time in parks and walking along the river. But I'm also slightly superimposing those early experiences onto the city. I don't know if it's romanticizing or it's just a simile, but it's my mind being in another place and enjoying that other place that I'm going to. Yeah. So just coming back to the two pieces, the two excerpts that you Mm. read out, what is it about those two parts of the poem that work for you? Well, I wrote some notes this morning and I was thinking about it and how in the past, I think I said how wonderfully depressing it was, but I don't think it is depressing at all. I think it's just that it turns from something so optimistic, the young love and the idea that that can conquer everything, that salmon will be in the street and, you know, an ocean will be folded up. And then it turns into something more pragmatic and realism. And I don't think that's a depressing thing. I think that's just what happens in your life. And when I think of myself in my early 20s and compared to now in my early 40s, in some ways I don't feel that different, but lots of things have changed. In my 20s, I wasn't thinking about a career or a pension and everything feels possible. And then as you get older, you're like, well, actually a pension would be useful. I don't have one, but at least I've thought about it. Um, (laughs) So so the bits that I chose, the idea that headaches and worry, I'm very good at worrying, but in that worry, the line vaguely life leaks away. And that's just such an incredible reminder that we have this life and it sounds like I'm sort of drunk down the pub talking about this sort of stuff and then you end with oh I love you mate <laughs> but a reminder to me to make the most of things and that if those worries become the sum total of what you've done then that's really sad and to not let things leak away so I don't think it's saying that that it will leak away vaguely but that it could do and that time will have his fancy Since I was a kid, always felt like there wasn't enough time to do everything I want to do. And school holidays were amazing because it was six weeks and I'd write a really long list of all the things I was going to do in that time. And then before I knew it, it was September again. Did you do that during lockdown as well? 
here's all the things I'm going to achieve now that I'm no, locked down. The time I had here halved immediately mm. because mm. of nurseries being closed, but I really enjoyed being with Iris more, my daughter. I was really productive in the studio and I think it was because it felt like things could change at any moment. So instead of just procrastinating, I just got on with things and they just felt like less obligations and um, that's an awful way of putting it. <laughs> but I don't know, it was a very peculiar time, but very productive for me. I certainly found, and I still feel guilty about this, not feeling obliged to go to a whole lot of exhibitions was a great relief. <laughs> And also making an appointment to go and see an exhibition meant you, you just re drastically reduced the numbers of things that you were seeing. And so you could really savour what you were seeing. Yes, I agree. I, I'm pretty bad at going to exhibitions, but I try to do it with a friend. Yeah. Um, instead yeah. of feeling like a job, do it as a leisure activity and to not worry about how many we go around to see. And you end up I seeing loads. So in researching this poem, I also came across the mention of the Auden group, which included T.S. Eliot, who helped Auden publish his first book, Louis McNeese, Cecil Day-Lewis, Stephen Spender and Christopher Isherwood. Now, I, I'm not massively familiar with these people. I mean, I know their names. I certainly know some poems by Louis McNeese, but I think we've agreed we're not great poetry readers. I do subscribe to Ambit magazine, which is poetry and short stories, which is fantastic because a lot of them are written by people who are talking about now or are talking about a different country that they've come from and what that's like to move to London. So a lot of it I can relate to, whereas a lot of the work, including Auden and Elliot, I have to really learn about what they're talking about because I didn't go through the war and I'm not English. But what was interesting, and I'm just squeezing this in on principle, I must admit, Hannah, is that group of men really overshadowed the female writers at the time. And so in the podcast notes, I'm going to list... <laughs> The female poets and writers I came across. That's fantastic. I look forward to looking <laughs> them up. I know very little about poetry. And the list you mentioned, I only knew one other one, which was T.S. Eliot. So I'm definitely not a big reader of poetry. But the references I do have are mostly men. So it's definitely something for me to address. We will get onto that in that tut-tut kind of way a bit later. But just for now, the thing that struck me about this Auden group, and again, this is with very limited knowledge on my part, they seem incredibly preoccupied with time. It doesn't seem to me a coincidence that this piece and that wider group that you mentioned, that it was in the wake of the Second World War and the First World War would have been in living memory. So I don't know how that could not affect them. And there are parallels with the pandemic and what we're going through at the moment. It's not as devastating, I hope. Um, I was going to say obviously, but we, you know, we're in it, so we don't know. But I think there are definite parallels to collective anxiety and a shared experience that's happening and an evaluation of our values and what's the word? Anyway, I've lost a word. <laughs> but what do you mean, though? You mean like um, the way that we shape our lives? Yeah, I think maybe I did say, it, you know, what we value, where we want to put our energy. And at the moment, there's time to reevaluate and to reset in some ways. And... I wonder what will come out of it, you know, in, in terms of art and culture. Yes, yeah, so do I. One of them actually wrote a poem about living in great anxiety. And I thought that will also be ongoing, speaking of time. Yeah. But I wonder if it was time of lives cut so suddenly short and things that they knew so drastically changed that made them think about time. And certainly things like not being able to see friends, you really get a sense of how critical your friends are. I remember one day thinking, I'm going to ring my close friends and say, I really love you. I really miss you. Because I've moved countries, I do have that experience of missing friends and really valuing them. But you do want to luxuriate in taking things for granted because it means that life is quite good. But then other things have erupted, like some artists have changed their art practice. And then in a wider society, of course, the fantastic thing that's happened was the Black Lives Matter march of a group of people saying, you know what, I'm damn well fed up with this. And a lot mm -hmm. of other people going along to the march saying, yeah, well, you know, a lot of us don't want it either. So 
I think that's been really positive for the lucky ones of us who didn't get it, of course. Yes, I agree. There are positives that come out of it. If you have luckily not been affected more than just having less social life. I started running three times a week around the park. It's become a regular thing and I've been wanting to do that for so long and I don't know what's stopping me. Same I'm with the- me starting this podcast. It was planned about yeah. a year prior to me actually doing it. Oh, it's great that it's happening. I think going back to the idea of time, obviously this was written how many years ago? Is it 80 years ago? 1937. But there's things in it like, I'll love you till the ocean is folded and hung up to dry. And that's written in a way that it's impossible for that to happen. But I actually think we're really trying hard to wring the ocean up to dry it out at the moment, aren't Mm -hmm. we, it feels Mm -hmm. like. And so the sense of time at the moment and time pressing it's it's not that our loved ones are going off to war and aren't going to return Mm. but it's for me it's about environmental issues and how much time we've got left to correct behavior or to make changes and so I think there's still some relevance to the things in here today with the overarching idea of time but the backdrop is different obviously well being a landscape Um, painter it's impossible to paint the landscape without thinking about the environment so do you want to talk a bit about your feelings on that (laughs) I've walked right into this haven't I you brought it up (laughs) as I said yesterday I don't think you can paint the landscape or engage with the landscape without thinking about the environment but it's not at the forefront of my mind it's not the reason I do paint nature but it's definitely there and it's certainly a concern and one of the reasons I don't make sculptures so much because I don't want to make more objects that turn into landfill Mm. A painting's got less of a footprint, especially the sculptures I make, because they're big, ugly blobs, you know, (laughs) expanding foam. I mean, that is so bad for the world and on every level. (laughs) But I don't feel I know enough about environmental issues to make a stand or to make particular points. I feel like I really need to read a lot more and educate myself. It is a huge worry and I feel a little bit powerless Speaking of the environment and your landscape painting, I mean, what's critical about your practice is that it's focused on the West Country where you grew up. And I had to ask you about this. I understand that includes Cornwall, Devon, Dorset and Somerset. And Wiltshire Mm -hmm. sometimes comes into it, but essentially they're the main areas. As you say, you've had a painting practice now for a long time looking at that area. So what sort of changes have happened throughout, for instance, I think there's a fairly recent painting of yours, which is an area that is planned to have a car park built on it. More recently, I've been painting London scenes. I think because I don't spend so much time in the West Country, so the two areas that I paint are either East London or Devon and Cornwall. And the area of Devon is Crediton, mid-Devon, mostly where I grew up. And the Tesco one you mentioned is on the outskirts of Crediton. And so that series was called The Field Next to Tesco that is soon to be built on. And it was the first time I titled a piece of work acknowledging exactly where it is and what's happening to it. And it's because when I'm making work, the titles tend to be very, very descriptive. So it's just where it is. And because it didn't really have a name for me, I mean, I did look it up. I read the planning applications and found out the name, but it was always to me the field next to Tesco. And it wasn't a very beautiful piece of land, but it was a place that I had visited many times over the years and enjoyed on the way to another location that I've painted a lot called Uton. And so when I found out that this huge car park was going there, I felt I wanted to record it before it changed. And I'm not doing that in a way of saying that it's positive or negative. I'm doing it in a way of acknowledging that the land has changed. I guess there's a start of a conversation. And have you always painted landscape? Where has this come from? No, I um, I studied sculpture from foundation onwards up to MA at the Royal College. And it was while I was there, which was 2004 to 2006, that I started working with images of the countryside and working with images again, which I hadn't done for a very long time. And I tentatively made my first painting, which was a tiny little thing. And the material 
I guess I just fell in love with it, the romantic part of me. But it also really suited my personality and my temperament and my way of working. I thought I could find my place within painting. And so what was the sculpture that you were doing? It was things from the landscape. Okay. So rocks and fences and sort of visual signifiers that we have in the landscape and, and things that we might consider very British. So I would say that the work was about the British social and visual landscape. And in some yeah. ways that didn't change, just what I was making changed. Once again, going back to time, there's a massive shift in time in the poem. And when it's the voice of the lovers, it says... The years shall run like rabbits, for in my arms I hold the flower of the ages and the first love of the world. And this idea of running like rabbits, this sort of manic breeding frenzy kind of time, which I think is your 20s. And later, the piece that you refer to of the plunging of the hands, which is such a beautiful idea. It reminds me of the whole ritual of washing the dishes and staring into the basin. And so you get this change into a slowness of nothing much happening, time to think about something. I think in some ways your paintings describe time. Do you think I've got that right or? I'm really glad you've said that. Yes, thank you. I suppose the landscape contains compressed time in the, I mean by that, but it's all these different experiences and things have happened and they're laid over each other and you can see them, you can read the landscape, you can read how things have changed, but also I think my paintings contain time for me in the time taken to make them. They're quite, what's the word? <laughs> time consuming. <laughs> there's, a, there's quite a lot of labour in them. Yeah. And time spent looking at something. So I think that's why I enjoy making them so much is that I get to spend time with a view, one which I admire so much that I sort of want to recreate it. And although it's a single image, all those hours spent making and looking hopefully are imbued in that image and also the wider conversation about time and how we spend our time and you know a life a mortality as this poem's about to enjoy a landscape for me is a very good use of time but I never feel like I have enough time to go out but you go um, out and photograph yeah. the landscape so you obviously do get out there I do, yeah. But more recently, I guess that's why it's been London landscapes, because they're right on my doorstep. Mm. It feels disingenuous to me now to go on the train or the car to Devon and to look for images, then return to London and paint them. So the images from Devon and Cornwall are from when I've spent time there, when yeah. I've been there for at least a few days, more often a week. And I can revisit the place many times so I, I used to just be a bit of a magpie. I just wanted every landscape. Once I realized I loved painting landscapes, that was it. I wanted them all. <laughs> and I've slowed down and I've got areas that I return to. And I really enjoy revisiting and seeing how they've changed and seeing how they change compared to the way I've painted them because I changed so much. So when I go back, it's not like I'm returning to this space that I know. It, it's completely refreshed and I want to start again because I've not painted it very faithfully or just painted a small section of it or it's changed you know the, the river just slightly changes course or thinking of the Devon ones they're managed so more recently the London sites are because I can get back to them with ease I very rarely do go back to them when I'm painting them but I like to have that option there at the moment I'm painting Victoria Park again which I've painted a few times over the years and I'm in the park almost every day Although you have been barred from the park. Yes, well, it's open again now, but for a couple of weeks in the summer, it was closed. And I burst into tears when I found yeah. out. So a lot of those sketches have ended up being Victoria Park from the outside, including the metal bars of the fence. Yeah, I found myself walking in the evening around the perimeter of the park as close as I could get to it if I couldn't go inside mm. and seeing views that looked like my paintings, ironically, for the first time because I empty out the space of people and signs of life and looking into this almost empty park. There were a few people in there that spoilt it and shouldn't have been there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was only two weeks, but yeah, it changed my viewpoint of the park. But also when I went back into it and started running again, I was running right up to the perimeter that I hadn't previously gone up to. 
And so what, why is it that your landscapes don't include people in them? Because I think for myself anyway, as soon as a person is in the landscape, then the landscape becomes a backdrop to the person. It becomes scenery. And I want it to be the whole subject. I also think that the people are in there in that there are signs of life. We do know that it's managed, that things have been planted. So, you know, we are there even though we're absent. It's not a wild landscape. In the artists or paintings that I admire, although there might be a figure in it, the main bit that holds my attention is usually the edges or the ground, the foliage, the backdrop. So I kind of, I don't entirely filter the people out, but they're not my main concern in other people's work either. I guess I want them for myself. I want them to be mine. (laughs) Well, fair enough. I mean, you manage them very well. So I think at least for a moment that they can be yours. Now, yeah. <laughs> you work in very different sizes, one extreme and the other. Very, very small, which is an image of a view of a landscape. And then very large, which tends to be the meticulous detail of a section mm-hmm. of the landscape or hedges. I think those small paintings have that sense of an Ansel Adams photograph where he will take a scene of I don't know a a majestic tree or a waterfall etc but because they're on a very small scale you have to look at them differently so his came about from a practical reason of there not being really large photographic paper at the time he was working but you've purposely made that decision as well as purposely making a decision to work very large blowing up details of the landscape where we can almost walk into those so can you talk about your decision making around those two scales it felt very natural to me when I started making larger paintings to zoom in And I'd made the small paintings for a decade or so, and they'd always been on that scale and a particular kind of viewpoint. So not having branches hanging over because that's a bit too dramatic and trying to choose a viewpoint where there's a certain distance. I decided to try making larger paintings, partly out of a desire to have more space to paint in and to use a different type of brush mark and have a different relationship to the painting. So to use, you know, your whole arm rather than just your wrist, just moving a tiny bit Mm. and to stand up to paint and to work on linen and have the bounce and a different fluidity of the paint. And once I found that that was something I wanted to explore, the next question was what type of view to paint. It just didn't make sense to me to blow the small paintings up large. It felt disingenuous to the small paintings that had sort of established their own territory. I didn't really want to take it away from them. Mm. I felt quite protective of them. As I said before, when people are in a landscape, they become the backdrop. My worry was if I made these paintings very large, that they are backdrops. And I'd found myself zooming into details in the landscape more often in the years which led up to the larger paintings, partly out of practical reasons, because I was photographing the park a lot more, Victoria Park, and because there were people everywhere, because it's such a well-loved park, which is wonderful, but not when you're trying to edit them out. And ideally, I don't want to do editing back in the studio in post-production. I I want to paint something which I've seen, that I remember, that Mm. I enjoyed. Mm. So I found myself looking into these much smaller spaces within the park, but they weren't necessarily going to make good paintings on a small scale. So the imagery that I was starting to collect, which was closer up and a desire to paint larger, the two came together. I wanted it to be like I was entering one of my small paintings. I certainly think they have that to them. And you were talking as well before about, I want to paint something that I've really seen. And you were talking about things being faithful to what is actually there and your memory of that experience. However, the colours are skewed somewhat. Can you talk to me about how you arrive at those colours? Yes, I think the colours, I've written down odd, but I'm not sure if that's necessarily the right word. But there's something just a bit off about them. I like to imply that they're a point of day when something's changing. So either the beginning of the day or the end of the day, those points going back to time when things are just beginning or they're nearer the end. I have always, in the small paintings, changed the colours a little bit, not on the land. They're, they're pretty green. In fact, for many years, just everything I painted was green. But I always changed the sky. They do have that sense of change. My favourite time of the day is dusk. 
because you get that shift and it's very different in the country than it is in the city. So you get that lovely hazy colour and, and a shimmering of light at the same time, you know, false mm -hmm. light. And in the countryside or even where you've talked about around the River Lee or around Walthamstow Marshes, mm -hmm. you can get these really unusual colours, these dusty apricots or dusty yellows, and they don't happen very often, but also they're not very often depicted. There is something about those colours and that time where distance is very difficult to discern. It feels like, yes, they're landscapes, but there's something very internalised about them. They feel like rooms of landscape mm -hmm. rather than landscape out there. Because the thing that is really different about the landscape in this country versus where I'm from is the sky is very far away because it's this sort of nothing, pale grey backdrop most of the time. Whereas once you put these odd colours in it, it moves much closer to you. So I think that's what's very different for me about your work than historical landscape painting. I think that's a wonderful reading of it. Thank you. And I hadn't thought of that, the distance, but you're absolutely right. It does bring it closer. It does mean that distances are more difficult to read. Mm. And I really enjoy that time of day when it's not more dramatic, but it's more sublime that there's a certain fear in the landscape as it becomes darker and you can't judge things in quite the same way. It leaves room for your imagination to creep in and to find things that could be not scary, but that there's more room for menace at that time of the day. And you can get a bit spooked out being left in the landscape and feeling quite alone. And I think that can be really enjoyable. And to have to rely on instincts a bit more and to be more aware that, you know, you wouldn't be sort of walking along the path, checking your phone at the same time. You're aware because because there's a deep-seated instinct to protect yourself. Maybe yeah. you're more aware of it because it is that shifting from daylight where you feel kind of safe in the day to night where mm. you know you ought to be inside or certainly yes. not be in a lonely place. But if you turned up that colour a notch, your paintings would have a very specific narrative or they would imply there's a very mm. specific narrative behind them. And I was looking just this morning at Remen Sadani's film that's part of the Jerwood FBU Awards alongside Guy Oliver's film. Anyway, Raman Sadani's piece is called Walk Out One and there's no blue sky anymore. It's all orange dust. And there's that that I get with your work, that it's just short of being menacing, you know, just short mm. of this overarching narrative that's telling us what's going on. I guess I'd just like to throw a few question marks in there. Is this okay? Is there something menacing happening? Or is it really beautiful colours? To not sort of label it definitely or lead somebody into a particular state. Well, they do become yeah. darker, like the palm yeah. shifts into more yeah. of a darkness. Going back to the colours, so the larger ones have mostly got colour filters over them just to shift things just slightly, to move them just a few degrees away from the original and in the body of work I've just started, I've colour matched it to images of Millet's Ophelia. And how's that going? Well, <laughs> <laughs> awful, horrible paintings. It's going okay. <laughs> I've had a horrible two weeks of painting and everything's been absolutely rubbish. And um, I'm hoping to battle my way through it. So. But I think that's good. You did say to me in preparation for this that it's like you can't paint all over again. I tend to mm. think is quite a good sign. Thank you. I hope so. I'm not in a place of complacency, let's put it that way. Mm. But um, because there's a colour shift just slightly and it's amazing how the palette just moves a little bit and I feel completely like I'm free falling. And I guess, you know, that's exciting and it's another reason to keep coming to the studio mm. but I'm dreaming about it so at night I'm picking up brushes in my sleep and trying to fix areas of the painting that I don't like. So when it's not being all-consuming it's also being objects and you have created objects obviously sculptures but I want to just drill into one aspect of those objects the rope which keeps popping up. You had some in an exhibition before long at Union Gallery so what are they about? They're based on the fender that you would get on canal boats and a traditional knot work fender, but made out of satin rope, which you'd usually find on curtain tie backs or upholstery. 
So they're very domestic. They're not remotely practical for outdoor on a barge. Mm. But I, I'm really drawn to curtain tassels because I just find them such bizarre objects. I don't know. I suppose it's a bit like going back to the poem when your your hands are in the dishwater and you're just staring. I remember being somewhere and just staring at this curtain tie back and just thinking, why? I think they're horrible and awful, but at the same time, I love them. And I bring back childhood memories of curtain tie backs and playing with the tassels and just running your fingers through it and it being a really tactile object. And they appear in a particular way on the wall, collapsed, spread out. I thought they were some sort of reference to opening the curtains so that you could see the landscape. Well, I guess they could be. And also a reference to our tastes and styles that are used. And there's something you don't see so often in homes that they're not really used in contemporary decor. Or if they are, it's to imply sort of opulence or something from the past. And yes, they would be used to frame the window Mm -hmm. to the landscape. And I think Going back to the large paintings, when I was looking for images for the large paintings, I found myself looking for hedgerows or spaces that reminded me of motifs from interior design, like a William Morris wallpaper or Liberty, and finding in the brambles almost a repeat pattern that happens. So those design references and motifs of nature Mm. fit in with the curtain reference for me that the interior and bringing the landscape indoors and domesticizing it and I think the large paintings are much more about nature rather than landscape. So let's move on now to some of your other influences or artists who you particularly admire. Before the I will say late edition of Ellen Oldfest, you mentioned quite a few landscape painters, including Paul Nash, Graham Sutherland, Samuel Palmer, Constable. And you also mentioned to me the exhibition at the National Gallery in 2011, Forests, Rocks, Torrents, which is the Norwegian Mm -hmm. and Swiss landscapes from the Lund collection. And of course, they're all men. Yeah, I'm sorry, isn't it awful? (laughs) So, but there is such a thing of, you know, it's rather like the Palm and the Auden group. There's this idea that, you know, only men have big things to say about the war and society and women probably don't. And yet that's actually not true because here you are, Hannah Brown, being a landscape painter. Are you the woman to break through this relentless persistence in <laughs> the great English landscape? I think there are a lot of women painting landscapes I can reference. I just haven't. And I need to address that. I guess it's laziness on my part. Perhaps, but also you're an artist who enjoys the work of other artists who stay in one place and that sustains an art practice over a lifetime. And so traditionally they have been a certain sort of artist, but One of the artists that you did give me that I was particularly interested in, whose work I've come across before, is George Shaw. Now, he's a contemporary artist and he, like Constable, who painted ordinary scenes from his boyhood, George Shaw grew up on an estate near Coventry in the 70s and 80s. So he paints what he considers the ordinary scenes of his cityscape, let's say, in aircraft modelling paint, of all things, referencing care homes, laneways, derelict garages, closed down shops and pubs. And similarly, people are absent in his paintings as well. Mm, I love his work. I have done for many years and I really enjoyed the show at the National Gallery. They were on linen and you, you saw that coming through and it was like it was built up in layers. It felt much more like oil paint. A part of me just thinks you should just use oil paint, really. I remember when I first started painting pictures of landscapes on the MA, being asked whether I can do because hasn't landscape been done? And reading about George Shaw and how it was okay that he did landscapes because he didn't do them in oil paints. So it's not like they were oil paints. Oh, I Because that would be just beyond the pale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, but I also really appreciate that they're so local to where he grew up. That I think they're all of Tile Hill in Coventry. And I enjoy that, I guess, because I feel connected to certain locations. I don't just have one. But Uton in Mid-Devon, where I first started painting and returning to the same site, I have such a strong affection for it. 
And I, I think I like that there's something very authentic about choosing a site or it chooses you and really exploring it, that it being very, very specific. So with Graham Sutherland and Constable and, and the other big male names, they also often painted a particular area. You also mentioned the American painter Ellen Artfest. She's got quite mm. a different take. Yeah, I love her work so much. I think she might be one of my favourite painters. And what I really appreciate in part of that is that she doesn't paint from photographs. It's so rare to not have photography as part of the process, but also she paints so slowly and that there's such a dedication to a particular view. I was just watching a YouTube um, video before we spoke of her. It's a white cube one. It's called In the Studio, but she's not in the studio. She's in the woods and she returns to it day after day. I just love that commitment to a view, to really looking at it so thoroughly. But having said that, a lot of the contemporary painters who I really enjoy, it's the very opposite. They have really loose works that are made quite fast and have lots of gesture. So I'm, I'm conflicted with what kind of painter I want to be, but I think naturally I'm just slow. So maybe I don't have a choice. I also wanted to ask the Lady of Shalott, mm. the painting by John William Waterhouse. You've got a special affection for that one. I do. From an early age, it's one of the first paintings I properly fell in love with. Just wanted to look at for as long as possible. Just stay with it. And my sister and I both, I think, have an affection for that painting. And whenever we go to Tate Britain, we'd always go and see Our Lady. <laughs> and we'd dress up as the Lady of Shalott in the bathtub and, you know, and then for many years, not really admitting how much I love this painting because I don't know. It's just like yeah. deeply uncool. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's like that, that first love. Part of painting landscapes was me doing what I wanted to do. And, and part of revisiting the pre-Raphaelites is me looking closer at the paintings that I have enjoyed for a very long time. Yeah, I think yeah. for me, it's the colours. There's something so damp about it. So English mm. or British, mm. you know, that rich green and just really enjoy it. Now we all want to go and see your work. So you're in the John Moores, which congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Which is at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. Where else are you going to show? I'm in a group show at Union in January. And um, apart from that, I've got quite a quiet year, which is good. So I can paint my pond. You'll also have a lot of time for reading. Yes, now that I've given up television, since watching the documentary, The Social Dilemma on Netflix, every evening by 10 o'clock, my phone's turned off and I leave it in a different room and I'm sleeping better, I'm reading again. That's such a good idea. So do you have an alarm clock? Well, I have a three-year-old. So <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at the moment I'm reading Kate Atkinson, A God in Ruins. Oh, it's so fantastic. I don't want it to end. I'm so invested in the characters. I tried reading that or listening to that on Audible mm. and it's beautifully read by the same person who reads Patrick Melrose. And Patrick Melrose is such a devastating book that I couldn't listen to him read A God in Ruins. Oh dear. Anyway, it's a beautiful book, I agree. And in the last few months I've read Claire McIntosh, After the End, which was really depressing, not necessarily in a good way. I just cried the whole time because it's about a child who has a brain tumour and the parents can't decide whether he should die or not. And Patrick Gale, I could read everything he's ever written. So what have you read of his? I've read Take Nothing With You and Notes on an Exhibition. They're so well fleshed out, you know, it's so visual. It's like watching a film in your head reading it, but a, a really oh. poetic, beautifully written film. And... Queenie by Candice Carty Williams, which was really harrowing and thought provoking and stayed with me for quite a long time. And also Holly McNeish. Yes, Nobody Told Me, which is a book of poetry about her daughter and about becoming a mother and going up to the age of three. And it's just stunning. 
And the other ones I've read in the last couple of weeks or months is My Dark Vanessa and Girl, Woman, Other. Oh, Girl, Woman, Others. Oh, it's brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. And sorry, what was the other one? My Dark Vanessa. It's by um, Kate Elizabeth Russell. And it's about a girl who was abused by her teacher at school. And it goes through her life and the fallout of that abuse and how even in her 30s, she's still not really sure if she's in love with him or whether she was abused. And it's from her point of view. It's really brilliantly written well you take on some tough read <laughs> I really love books that go through periods of time and look at a life unfolding yeah. and what happens and look back on it that's really interesting because that really connects to your work as well the way that you stay with something for a very long period of time Yes, I don't know why I enjoy this so much, but it does seem to be a theme that comes up in the the novels I read, the films that I watch. Well, we're very much looking forward to seeing your work at John Moore's. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Good luck with that. And thanks very much for being on Art Fictions today, Hannah Brown. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you to this week's guest and to all the artists who continue to inspire this podcast. And thank you for listening to Art Fictions with me, Gillian Nye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, please review, and of course you're welcome to get in touch with me directly if you'd like more information via my Instagram, artfictions2020, or my website, gilliannight.co.uk. Across these you'll find images of the artist's work, as well as any relevant links we mentioned today. Many thanks to Griffin Knight for his original music composition and performance. Happy reading and art viewing till next time. Have you got any working time left in your studio now? Yes, I've got an hour. No, 45 minutes before I have oh. to wash the brushes. Right, okay. Pick up the little one. But I think I can finish that study in that time. Oh, wow. God, that's yeah. really quick.